Well, we want to continue with our study of fatal error and how we determine what fatal error is. And I hope you'll keep in mind what we have studied this morning. And of course, you have the, the book there to help you be reminded of that. And we'll try this afternoon to get more specifically into it, although I think the student uh, should really realize already exactly what it means to say or how we determine what is erroneous, but then what is fatal error. But we hope to make that clear this afternoon and try to keep this in mind regarding the whole theme of the lectureship starting Wednesday night. I am affirming that any doctrine causing one to omit or violate a God-authorized obligation pertaining to becoming a Christian or that is necessary to living the Christian life is a false doctrine that constitutes, therefore, fatal error. Now, I say it's identified as fatal error because the belief and practice of the same stops one either by commission or omission, from doing only and all of what God has authorized, in this case an obligation, one to do in order to be saved from one's sins or remain saved, that is to be faithful, child of God and the Lord's church. Having stated the foregoing regarding fatal and non-fatal error, I must forcefully stress, and I did, again, I did that this morning, but I must say it again. I want to give great emphasis that no church member can remain in fellowship with God while practicing a doctrine that one knows is error, but teaches and practices it as if it were the truth. So I'm not talking about that kind of thing when I speak of non-fatal error. For a person knowingly to engage in any error representing it all the time to be the truth is, as I pointed out this morning, nothing less or more than hypocrisy. And all hypocrisy is sin. It's pretending to be something you know you're not and wanting people to believe that the pretense is what you really are. Suffice it to, then to say that those knowingly engaged in practicing error are themselves guilty of fatal error. They, thereby they are separated from God in a lost condition and we say regarding hypocrisy, due to our human limitations, all of us more than likely will die in fellowship with people who are themselves not in fellowship with God. And for the simple reason, we can't always know what some people don't want us to know. In other words, secrets are not called secrets because it's just a word. It means something I know you don't know. And so people can commit secret sins. But God knows all things. So while we know the Lord said, By their fruits you shall know them, that is, by their acts you can know what they believe. And we can know people that way. We don't always know what all's gone on in their mind or what went on in their past before we ever knew them. That may be completely contrary to God's will. And they have never repented of it. So I, I hope we understand that. But as I point out, God does not hold us accountable to such things as that because it's beyond our abilities as humans to know those things. So we want to concentrate as far as other people's lives and recognizing who is in need of obedience to the gospel or who needs to repent of their sins as children of God that it is by their fruits you shall know them, Matthew seven twenty. And also the Apostle John penned, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. That sounds like our studies in the auditorium in 2 Peter. Both were emphasizing that the truth is here. God, this is a wonderful thing about it. I don't have to worry about the truth being here. God has done everything and told me it will always be here. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word won't. What I must be very sure of, and God expects me to do it, and it is a way that I demonstrate my love for Him and my faith in Him and my concern for spiritual matters, is that I must be very sure to be on truth's side and to fellowship only those people who are truly faithful to God, really Christians. 
So we must not be found willfully or willingly ignorant of matters pertaining to our salvation. I've actually come across people over the years at different times, different places, and I know other people have too because they've told me about it, to where you try to present something to somebody and they say, I don't want to hear about that. Well, why? If it's pertaining to your salvation or your relationship and fellowship with other members of the church. Well, some people think if they can just block off a knowledge of a sin, then they don't have to deal with it. But the Lord never did teach any such thing as that. That's willful ignorance, is being willingly ignorant of something when you could know it and you choose not to do so. Once again, it must be emphasized that without a correct understanding of how the Bible authorizes us to act and then how we ascertain Bible authority, we cannot know whether a thing is error at all, much less a fatal error or non-fatal error. We don't know how to identify and know the difference between the two because we don't know how the Bible authorizes. Now, we spend a lot of time in biblical hermeneutics, and that's really where this whole uh, lesson comes to bear. It simply is the science of the interpretation of the Bible, and it gets into the matter of how language works. Uh, Sonia and Ken and I and a few others sometimes stand amazed at um, folks who deal with language all the time and yet when they write it <laughs> it comes out about every way but the way it ought to <laughs> and it's never easy on any of us no matter how good we are at it you have to go back over and say now does that word fit here and believe it or not in writing all this stuff and uh, going over the book then there's a lot of things, you know, what well, should this word fit here? And if you're a writer of any sort, you're always saying, well, which is the best word to use to say what you have on your mind or to convey what the Bible actually says? And that comes down to the work even of a translator. Think about somebody that's so scholarly, they know the Koine Greek like they know their own mother tongue and vice versa. Now, they're wanting to say in the English language, if that is the mother tongue, they're wanting to say in that exactly what they know the Greek said here. But the Greek says it another way. It presents it differently because its grammar is different. So they've got to be so scholarly, so knowledgeable, it's got to be a working knowledge that they can say, well, here's what it says here, and I know how to say it. Hey, without grammar, you can't. <laughs> they've got to know that English grammar. So, so they do that. Well, that gets into also the area of, uh, of the matter of knowing God's will. Now, somebody said one time, well, I'm glad we don't know, have to know Greek to go to heaven. Listen, somebody did. I want you to think about that for a minute. I'm glad we don't have to know Hebrew to go to heaven. Somebody did. What you hold in your hand is a translation of Hebrew and Greek. Now, somebody did. So, it, it's a very important point. Well, when it comes down to rules of interpreting the scriptures so that we will get out of it only what God put into it, and intended for us to get out of it, rather than reading stuff into it. It's awful easy to do that. It really challenges a person. That's one of the reasons that the study of the law many times parallels the study of the Bible. Because you have testaments, you have covenants, you have a will being presented to man. And you get into a lot of that kind of study when it comes down to, to law and writing wills and things like that. So it just simply comes down to how does a language work to impart knowledge to somebody. And in rudimentary matters of everyday living, you don't have to be too precise. We were backing out of the driveway a while ago, and we have relatively new neighbors to the left, and Jody was in the back of the truck with Emma and paying more attention to that. And I said, is is that a new Honda sitting there? Now notice how I said it. Question, is that a new Honda sitting there? There where? Of course, I was thinking she's looking straight up the next driveway like I am, and we get into a bit of a conflab. Well, where? What? She misunderstood, or maybe I didn't make myself clear that it was a... Uh, a new Honda. She thought I said a red Honda. So she said, well, where's a red Honda? I said, I'm not talking about a red Honda. Now that, see, that gets over the very point I'm trying to make about when you communicate what's on your mind, there are several things involved besides just her ability, in this case, to understand it, as to me expressing it so she can. Well, aren't you glad that God has vouchsafed his word on this earth, it reveals his will because it has to do with whether David Brown goes to heaven or hell. 
And he said, I've done my part and I guarantee you it will be here. Now you do your part, and I know I made you such a way where you can do your part if you will employ your faculties to so do it. So when I understand in English what has been accurately translated from the Greek, it means I've got to know something about how verb works, what a noun is. I have to know something. Now you may not be able to always call those various terms. But you've got to have some working knowledge of it. Or you will be wondering about that Honda and thinking it's red, but I didn't even refer to it as red. I just said, is it a new Honda? And she, here we go. Now, that's just on simple matter. Do you realize how many times people have gotten serious fallouts over that kind of misunderstanding on, on other matters? So, when it comes down to fatal error, we know what error is. It's a transgression. Uh, it's a mis well, I won't say it's just a transgression. It's just a lack of understanding properly of something, and, and thus you hold a view that it really is not taught. What if I were to tell you that the Apostle Paul may have believed that the world was flat? You know, a lot of folks at that time that did. In order to be saved from his sins by the gospel of Christ, would Saul of Tarsus have to convert, if he so believed that the world was fat, would he have to convert from believing the world was flat to that it was round in order to be saved by Jesus Christ? But it's error. I even use stuff from the Bible to show that the world is round. But is that essential to my salvation? It's the truth. But that's what I mean by all things must be authorized, but all things aren't obligatory. So, does that have a bearing on a man's salvation? Well, if I show him the truth of it, and there's the Bible, he says that's the Bible, and the Bible says that, and he says, well, I'm not going to believe it anyway, that changes things altogether. <laughs> changes a whole lot. So, we'll develop that, I hope, as, as we go on. But I'm affirming that any doctrine causing one to admit or violate a God-authorized obligation pertaining to becoming a Christian, or that is necessary to live in the Christian life is a false doctrine that constitutes fatal error. Man is responsible to God. Now you know to get that across to a whole lot of folks is a big, big job done. Man is responsible to God. Responsible for his thoughts, words, and actions. When he learns that he is responsible to God, then he ought to seek to learn from the Bible God's word what his obligations to God are with the full intent when he learns them of discharging them in order to be pleasing to his God. Well, to get a person to understand, you understand that, you've come a long way. This is the very point made in a number of scriptures, such as Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And on and on we could go. Now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Save yourselves this untoward a crooked generation. There are a lot of things in there that says you have a responsibility. And though God wants you saved and loves you and done all possible for you to be saved, what you are responsible for, He will not do it for you. So we've done a lot if we can get that over to, our, uh, over to who we preach to and especially over to ourselves. So this is the reason that we refer to obligatory and non-obligatory matters in scriptures. We have obligations to God. The word of God sets those obligations out in his authoritative will. So our duty to God is discharged correctly only when we comply with what God and his word obligates us to do concerning our salvation from sin and in order to live the Christian life and that is being faithful. And of course without the word of God we can't know anything about it. Now, one thing we need to emphasize is that authorization is what establishes obligation. And there must be an obligation before you can try to figure out the best and quickest way to discharge the obligation. The obligation is the same for everybody when it comes to what must I do to be saved, or as a child of God, what must I do to be faithful. 
It's the same for everybody. Regardless of how much Bible you know or how little you know or how long you've been in the church, every one of us today had an obligation to assemble with the saints and in that assembly engage in the worship of God as God is authorized, which it comes down to five acts of worship that must be done in spirit and in truth. The right attitude, we direct the acts of worship to God, and we operate as the truth of the New Testament says in this worship. Now, that doesn't make any difference uh, how long you've been in the church. All of us assembled, and in assembly we discharge an obligation, Hebrews 10.25. And in that assembly we discharge further obligations because we want to please God. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14.15. There is no way to prove your love of God or your faith in God without keeping his commandments. So, why, why do we have microphones? Why do we have song books? Because they help us, notice help, help us do or discharge the obligation. We, would, we have authority for them because they help us do only what God said we must do. I often in times, different places, especially in a gospel meeting, we'll just simply ask the song director, are you, are you authorized? Think about it. Tell me where you read of a song director in the New Testament, in the worship of the church. Where there are just so many words conveying that idea that there was somebody who led a congregation in worship that we call the director singing. It's not there. Well, is it wrong? No, because everybody is to do and worship things decently and in order. There, everybody at least has to know what a song is so they can all sing the same thing. That seems decently in order to me. It would be terrible if everybody out here is all singing a different song at the same time. Well, you have to start all at the same time. You have to hopefully keep the same beat all at the same time, which gets to be interesting. But nevertheless, decently in order, I can look up the words, I can know it means... It means what it means. Everybody does the same thing at the same time in a proper way. So that's why you have a song leader. He leads in the full meaning of the word leading when it comes to songs. And so it is with the song book. It helps you discharge the obligation. The obligation is to sing and helps us all sing the same words. All of that's part of it. You can't read of any such thing other than the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, yet we're taught to sing as a part of our worship. Well, I have to use my mind to understand all of that. So these things like song books, microphones, even the pews facing this way and the pulpit facing that way testifies to something. You ever ask yourself the question, what can, be, what can be shown about the way a church auditorium is built? There's a message to be proclaimed. It needs to be heard. There's pews that say most people are out there looking this way. That tends to say those folks will be listening to these folks at a certain time. And on and on you can go. All of that's involved. But now when it comes to the songbook, there's nothing in the New Testament that says you must use a songbook or you sin. You must have a song leader or you sin. But the obligation to sing is there, congregational singing. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That implies that since we're to do all things decent in order, that you've got to have something that helps you do it decently and in an orderly fashion. Well, what about eating in a church building? I don't know of anything the New Testament says that you must eat in a church building in order to live a faithful Christian life. On the other hand, I do not know a thing in the New Testament that says you cannot eat in a church building 
and you know what I mean by church building, I hope, that you can't eat in a church building. A common meal. Do I need to define common meal? <laughs> in a church building. Although there have been brethren who said you sin if you eat a common meal in the church building. Well, let's see. Churches, I know from my study of the New Testament, used to meet in homes. The normal operation of a home in somebody's house is to have a room in that house where they prepare meals. So if it is automatically a sin to eat where the church worships, then I'm not going to let you eat at my I worship at my house. Because <laughs> I'm not going to tear the kitchen out for you to come in there and worship. Do you see people have messed up the idea? They don't know the difference in an obligation that does not change and it's something that aids us or helps us discharge the obligation which itself is not directly obligatory or although it's authorized that song book's authorized the song leader's authorized but it's not obligatory I remember Brother G.K. Wallace saying many years ago, back in the 20s when he started preaching, said nearly it was a custom for nearly everybody when they came before the congregation to lead prayer to kneel. And it got to be to where people just thought that's the only way it could be done. And one time he didn't think anything about it. They asked him to close the service out where he was preaching a gospel meeting. He stood there and led the prayer. And as soon as he got back to the back of the building to shake the brethren out, the old man came up to him very upset and said, you didn't kneel when you led prayer. I thought Brother Wallace handled that pretty well. He said, which is worse, not kneeling or peeping? <laughs> man had to see that he wasn't kneeling when he prayed. The posture that we should be concerned about when we pray, whether it's a man leading prayer before a group or not, is the posture of the soul. That's what we are to humble. So people get those things mixed up, and they don't know the obligation from that which helps them discharge the obligation. So while this song book, or while somebody leading singing, or the PA system, helps a person perform the obligation, and the obligation is the same for everybody in doing that given thing. The other matters are authorized, but they're not obligatory. I've seen situations where in some of the poorer parts of the world, they couldn't afford a song book. Maybe the fellow that led the singing, or maybe you might say started the singing, so they'd all start at the same time. He would have the song book, nobody else had one. And he would read the real quickly, uh, well, like, Lord, we come before thee now. And then they would sing, Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. At thy feet. And that's the way they would do it. Well, I admit that is not quite as advantageous as each one having the book and doing it all at the same time and therefore foregoing having to say that. But there's not a thing in the world wrong with it. But it's not obligatory. And somebody could hold the view, well, I don't like eating in the building. It offends my conscience. I don't like them singing that way or whatever. You can do a lot of things to yourself personally and restrict yourself in various ways in the areas of which I'm speaking. But you can't tell Eric down here, you can't eat in the building, Eric. Because it offends your conscience, and it offends your conscience because I know it offends mine. <laughs> you can't do that. There are a lot of things like that. I think I use the example. Everybody knows in this room, at least I think they do, that one must be baptized for the remission of sins. I've mentioned illustrations. I ran into it up in Arkansas many years ago, and I've read about it also. So at one time, there were a few people in the church, hither yon, that thought you had to be baptized in running water. Now, I don't know for sure how they came to that conclusion, but 
uh, they did. Now let me ask you something. It is not an obligatory thing that one be baptized in running water in order to be saved from your sins, to be obedient to the plan of salvation. And let's suppose somebody said, well, I want to be baptized in running water. That's, con that's my conscience. It says, I just think it would be better. What's the obligation to be baptized in water? If that person has believed in Christ, repented of his or her sins, confessed faith in Christ, and wants to be baptized in running water, and there's running water available, I'll be glad to baptize in running water. Like the old preacher said one time, just turn the spigot on in the baptistry and pull the plug, and we'll baptize you in running water. I'll accommodate that. Don't you know that's what Paul's talking about when he talks about the brethren weak in the faith? I don't know what we think sometimes faith is. What do we think it to be, I guess? Listen, faith comes by hearing the word of God. A brother is weak in the faith, therefore he's weak in his knowledge of the word of God. Thus a brother weak in the faith is weak in his knowledge of the word of God. And yet he's a brother. And we have to treat him as a brother weak in the faith, thus weak in his knowledge of the word of God. Which by itself indicates there are things you cannot be right on as a Christian, and yet I can still fellowship you. And that gets back to fatal error and non-fatal error. And the case they were talking about was peculiar to their culture and their religion and their society. And it was meats offered to idols. And we dare not offend the weaker brother because he doesn't understand some things. And if you eat a meat, a meat offered to an idol, he's going to think that you participate in worship that idol or something like that. Well, we don't have a problem with that nowadays in this country. I've never had to be concerned about eating meat offered to an idol that would cause one of my brothers or sisters to stumble. Now, God, by the way, never intended for a weak brother to always be weak. I've seen somebody, <laughs> I've seen some people try to argue that from the standpoint of saying, well, they're just always weak. Well, that may be true of some folks, but it's not what God desires. If they're always going to be weak, <laughs> then they may not be doing what they ought to be doing to not be weak. But when you've got a lot of converts, as they did, then coming out of rank idolatry with no background whatsoever in a society, culture, or even the Old Testament like the Jew, then you had a lot of things you had to deal with. And if you go into some countries today outside the American culture and society, you will find out some of the people have some of those same things to deal with. For example, as I've used many times, in Indonesia or an Islamic country, they just don't use that left hand. Well, I don't think I can find anything in the scriptures that says, if you use your left hand, you will be lost. I just don't find it. Because they're raised and brought up in a society and culture that's dominated by Islamic teaching, then those people have a peculiar view in the way they do it, even though they believe the gospel and are Christians. So you respect some of those cultural things and that they do that's not necessarily something they teach you must do to be faithful to God, but they still honor it. I've mentioned from time to time uh, Brother Azgar Ali in um, Pakistan. Raised a Pakistani, converted out of Islam many years ago. And we used to joke with him just to see how he handled it. <laughs> he'd be down in Singapore and we'd say, Brother Ali, let's go over here and have some pork. He'd get very solemn-faced and he'd say, Oh, I don't mind. I understand there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it scripturally, but I just choose not to. He said, I have to live with it all the time when I'm in Pakistan. I don't have the choice. I just soon never get myself into something like that. Well, see, we don't have to face that as far as I know here unless you've got a lot of Muslim and Jewish friends. <laughs> so you can see people can hold views for various reasons for themselves. That they won't do certain things that you feel perfectly free to do because the Bible authorizes it. But it's not an obligatory matter. An obligatory matter is the same on every one of us. Everybody become a Christian must hear the Word of God. Everybody become a Christian must have faith formed 
in Christ based upon the evidence in the Word of God. Everybody must repent of their sins. Everybody must confess faith in Christ. Everybody must be baptized for the remission of sins. I don't care what's going on. You teach a doctrine that will not allow one of those steps of the plan of salvation, that is a fatal error because it separates you from God because it's sinful. I hope we're recognizing some of that kind of thing. I use several examples in here, and uh, some I've mentioned, some I didn't. But we do not want to make an option obligatory. We do not want to make an obligatory matter something that we can take or leave or make it optional. If it's obligatory, it's authorized by God's will, you must do it in order to be saved. You sin if you don't. But in the case of options, individually in your life, I've used the example of Brother G.K. Wallace again saying he never read a newspaper back in his day before he went to worship because he wanted his mind to be on everything he was doing in worship. Well, I could reason this way. Uh, he was a great preacher. He knew the Bible. That was good for him. I think we'll teach it to everybody. So it's a, it's a sin if you read the newspaper before you come to worship. You know, we're taught, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means since I know me better than you know me, and I know what I need to do to keep me in harmony with the Bible, I may saddle myself with a number of restrictions, but I don't have a right to saddle those or put those restrictions on you. There, I make them obligatory to me because they help keep David Bryan in line with the truth. But I have no right to teach somebody else. Now, I may have something that I believe that's not necessarily in harmony with the Scriptures. But it does not stop me from performing the obligations every Christian must believe in order to be faithful. Those things are just part of it. And you have to look in and do a lot of thinking along that line. Now, there's going to be doctrines taught on the Holy Spirit that if you follow them, they're going to cause you to violate some of what God requires of you in order to be saved. If I get the idea of the Holy Spirit doing for me something that God expects me to do for myself, then I better be very careful about that. Because God has said, I, David Brown, by my own intellect and my own will, am responsible for receiving with meekness the engrafted word and applying it honestly to myself and then seeing that I will to submit to his will. Now God's not going to do something for me that removes that responsibility from me. And if I teach a doctrine that says that he does, now I'm teaching a doctrine that says it's obligatory that he do so when the Bible says, no, it's obligatory that you do so, not the Holy Spirit. If God's going to strengthen me directly, independent of my will to learn the truth of the Bible and submit to it, then when I sin, who's responsible, me or God? Well, I've made God partially responsible or else he's completely unjust God. I'm supposed to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. How can I give an account of them when I'm not fully responsible for doing them? So I have to be careful about what I do as to what God, uh, responsibility or obligation or part is in my being saved. God has his part in my salvation. And you'll find from the Bible that it's always that which I could never, never, never do for myself. But what I am capable of doing, God expects me to do it and nobody else to do it. That's the reason that I cannot, by proxy, obey the gospel for you or you for me. That's the reason why you can't worship for me and I can't worship for you. That's the reason I can't give um, of my means on the first day of the week for you and you can't for me. I can't partake of the Lord's Supper for you and you can't for me. I can't study the Bible for you and you cannot for me. That, those are obligations that if I teach a doctrine that says, no, somebody else can do it for me, I'll go to heaven on my wife's coattail, and so I'm going to make sure she's very faithful. That won't work. This whole thing of Christianity comes down to my individual responsibility to God. And will I recognize that individual responsibility? And know that he's given me his word that tells me what I must believe and do to be saved. And I cannot put that over on somebody else and say, if you do it, that'll save me. Think of the parents that would be glad to be baptized for their children. Because their children are choosing not to be. 
Think of the people you know that are friends or acquaintances or family who maybe obeyed the gospel at one time. But they're unfaithful today. They never darken our church house door and are not even interested in it. Would you repent for them if you could? Well, it'd be the tendency. It'd be, be uh, I think we understand the truth. We wouldn't because we understand the individuality and each person's responsibility. But nevertheless, it shows you where, where your emotional types can lead you if you allow them just to run free without any guidance from God and His Word. There'd be that tendency. Do you remember the situation with the serpent, the brazen serpent that God raised among the children of Israel because they were bitten by the fiery serpents and God said, here's the cure. Get to where you can look on that serpent and you'll be cured. Remember what the children of Israel did with it years later? They made an idol and worshipped it. And so it was destroyed. Here is a good thing, a wholesome thing, a right thing that God used and yet when people got through with it or when they used it like they wanted to when it is it had been used as it intended and it all passed, they turned into something else. So if we're not careful, we will think that we can pass off our responsibilities and individual obligations and set out the word of God to somebody else or we'll try to take them on. I heard one fellow say one time, a long time ago, trying to work with a person who obviously was not faithful and people were really wanting to practice church discipline. And the comment came, well, don't destroy what little faith he's got. I still scratch my head and I think about that. Don't know what faith is, I tell you. If they knew what faith was and the man being unfaithful, they would have said something like that. What he was trying to say is, it's just, well, let's just get along with the fellow like he is. Go along, get along. And that's what happens when people let their own views and perspectives and ideas independent of the influence of the Bible guide them in things. They come up with some strange views. Well, I hope some of this, and by the time that all is through, that you'll appreciate something about how we must have all things authorized by the Bible, but all things authorized and not obligatory. And thus, we can have some things that can be erroneous, but they don't mitigate our complying with the will of God in the sense of discharging our obligations. Maybe it doesn't. I hope it does. But as we bring the lesson to a close, I urge your continued study of it. Let me just close by reading this to you and maybe to help regarding the upcoming lectures. Any doctrine about a personal, direct work of the Holy Spirit on the inward man, that's the spirit of a Christian, that augments one's own personal responsibility to discharge his salvation obligations to God is fatal error. Any doctrine teaching a direct work of the Holy Spirit on the inward man of the Christian that makes the Holy Spirit equally responsible with the Christian for discharging salvation obligations is fatal error. Any doctrine teaching that God will do for a Christian what he, that is God, obligates a Christian to do for himself regarding one's salvation obligations is fatal error. Any doctrine that removes from a man his own personal responsibility to do what the Bible obligates him alone to do regarding one's salvation obligations is fatal error. In other words, it's killing error. It separates you from God. You can't go to heaven. Any doctrine that places on a man a greater obligation concerning that man's salvation obligation than the Bible does is faith, fatal error. And the last one, any doctrine that places on a man a lesser obligation concerning that man's salvation obligation than the Bible does is fatal error. I don't really think this is as hard as some people might make it out to be. The Bible says that we're to speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10, that has to be speaking about things that are obligatory, things everybody must believe in order to become a Christian, and things as Christians that we must believe to be faithful. I close with this example. When Paul and Barnabas had a great dissension as they were about to begin their second missionary journey, they were not of the same mind and the same judgment. 
when it came to whether they should take or not take John Mark. And the difference was so sharp between them, they couldn't work together. And so Paul chose Silas, went on the second missionary journey, and Barnabas, who was uncle by the flesh, to John Mark, chose him, and they went to Cyprus, where Paul and Barnabas had begun the first missionary journey. Now, that was so strong, they couldn't work together. There's no indication at all in the Bible they sinned. None whatsoever. If it had been an indication they had sinned, they would have had to violate an obligatory matter concerning living the Christian life. They didn't, but they couldn't work together. And if two of the greatest men that walked this earth that faithfully served God couldn't work together over matters that are not obligatory, then I think we're going to expect to find that in the church as long as the church is on this earth. But there's no way that you can find that Paul went about saying, you know, that character of Barnabas. After all, I'm an apostle. What is he? He hasn't been baptized with Holy Spirit baptism. He ought to really, he, what kind of a man is he? You don't find any of that going on. And you don't find Barnabas saying, well, Paul, there he goes, shoving his apostleship around. And I've had hands of the apostle laid on me, and I have, I have miraculous abilities too. I went with him on the whole first missionary journey and, and I know about as much about this as he does. Why is he doing it? And so they fell out and they spread their doctrine through all the churches and he had a big split. That's the way we do it. A lot of it is attitude problems, not all of it. But some of it just comes down to where we don't know the difference in an obligatory matter and one that you can differ on. But when we do differ, brethren, over matters that are not obligatory, we better differ with the same attitude Paul and Barnabas had toward one another. And what developed out of that difference were two great missionary journeys, for neither one of them left off the obligation to go preach the gospel to every creature. They were trying to figure out what was the best way to get it done, and, one, and they disagreed over it. Paul said, it's not optional to take John Mark. He left us on the first one. This is not a training program. I don't think we need to do that again. We can almost see Barnabas say, yeah, but he's, he's a sister's son or whatever. Uh, I'll work with him. Well, I don't think so. Well, I do. Oh, uh, well, okay, if you feel that way about it. And so they went out to just a missionary journey. Some reason or another, we don't think things like can exist in the church between man like that. Look what Paul wrote, wrote 1 Corinthians 13. And yet, look who Barnabas is, the son of consolation. He who wrote the great agape chapter on love and the son of consolation went their separate ways because they couldn't get along with one another. And there's no thing in the Bible that says they transgressed God's will. That would have meant they violated an obligatory matter. But they disagreed. If my brethren would get their brains in gear and not so be determined I'm going to have my way, <laughs> and if I don't, I'm going to get my pound of skin, how much better off we'd be. So we need to understand that, brethren, and we need to know there's fatal error and there's non-fatal error. I think it's interesting that later on, Paul mentions how important Mark is to his work. Maybe it was Paul who made the poor judgment, or maybe made the right judgment, and with the work that Barnabas did with Mark, brought him right along. And maybe it was that Paul wasn't the kind of person that nurtured somebody quite like that, but Barnabas was. Was there a place for both of them in faithful service to God? Obviously so. But do we get that out of our own studies of the Bible? And when we get it, if we do, do we apply it to this congregation and individuals in it and every other congregation? Big difference, folks. It says a lot, of, a lot of thinking needs to be done. So if you're not a Christian, we invite you to become one this afternoon. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent of that sin. Come confessing it, we'll pray with you and for you. And I hope this lesson has helped to some extent at least get you started in thinking about these things of fatal and non-fatal error. If you're subject to the call of Christ, we invite you to come where we stand and sing.